Life feels stuck when life makes no progress. When you battle the same discouragement you faced a decade ago or struggle with the same fears you faced a year ago, when you feel as though everyone gets to the pool before you and nobody wants to help you. Friend, Jesus sees you. He has a new version of you waiting to happen. He says to you what he said to the man near the pool of Bethesda. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. That's John 5, verse 8. Stand up, do something, take action, pick up your mat, make a clean break with the past, and walk, hit the trail. Assume that something good is going to happen. Set your sights on a new destination and begin the hike. Getting unstuck means getting excited about getting out. And remember, friend, as you take communion, you are never alone. Shall we pray? Our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're just so humbled and honored to be gathered together here, serving you, Lord, worshiping you, thanking you for all that you do in our, in our lives. We do this in remembrance of you, Lord, and Lord, your mercy and grace is beyond measure, Lord, but surely it is sufficient for each and every one of us, and we are so thankful for that. Be with us as we partake of these elements, and be with us as we go out in the world and preach the gospel of your saving grace. For it is in your most precious and holy name we pray, Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen. Let us partake of the cup. First the bread representing Jesus' body. And now the juice representing Jesus' shed blood for our sins. Rejoice and be glad, this is the day the Lord has made. Come to him while he's near, call upon him while he can be found. It was around five years ago that the North American Christian Convention was in Anaheim. So Anna and I was there and some of you were there also. The highlight for me was Tim Tebow, one of the speakers at the convention. You might ask, well, who is Tim Tebow? Well, when he was in high school, he led his high school team to the state championship. He played college football at the University of Florida. Became the first player to win the Heisman Trophy as a sophomore. No one else has ever done that. He played in the National Football League, played for Denver Broncos, New York Jets, New England Patriots, Philadelphia Eagles. At one of the championship games, you probably remember, he put John 3.16 on his cheeks. During the game, he threw 316 yards. Yards per rush was 3.16. Yards per completion was 31.6. The ratings for the game for 31.6. The time of possession was 31.06. And during the game, 90 million people clogged up searching for what does John 3.16 mean? It became the number one thing in Facebook and Twitter and jammed up some of the internet service. At the convention where we were sitting, just above his head was the numbers on the wall, section 3.16. Tim Tebow was born on August 14, 1987, in the Philippines to missionary parents Bob and Pam Tebow. His mother had a lot of problems when she was pregnant, and the doctors in the Philippines are not as sophisticated as licensed doctors in the United States. 
So the doctors told her they couldn't help her, she just need to abort the child and she'd be okay. She refused. She gave birth to her son, Tim Tebow. And what a blessing he's been to so many people. At an interview once, he was asked, what are you gonna do with all this money? He says, first, I tithe to my church. And secondly, I support my parents in their mission work in the Philippines. There's a long list of other things he did after retiring from football. He wrote many books, and I have read one of them. Another story about a very familiar athlete. God had a plan for that child, Steve Curry, mom confesses. She almost aborted him, but changed her mind and planned parenthood in just the last minute. Stephen Curry, plays for the Golden State Warriors in Sacramento. Stephen Curry is considered by many people to be the best shooter in basketball history. He shoots more three-point shots in a game than any other player. And now he's mastered the four-point play. And they'll probably become national champions because of it. Sitting down with an interview with Pastor Luke Norsworthy, Steph's mother, Sonia, explained how she almost never came to fruition because she was having so many troubles. In her book entitled Fierce Love, Sonia says she was considering abortion while pregnant with Stephen, but changed her mind while she was at Planned Parenthood. Thank God she changed her mind. Well, there are other stories, believe it or not, with mothers who were thinking of abortion and they changed their mind and their child had become rich and famous. There's been a survey taken of 100 preachers asking why they don't say anything about abortion from the pulpit. Why don't they preach about abortion? Come to find out from the survey, there are five fears preachers have. That's why they don't mention abortion. Obviously, they aren't my fears. I'm preaching about abortion today. Five fears preachers have about preaching about abortion. Number one is, my congregation will think I'm being political. And you know I'm not being political, I'm being biblical. Another reason they don't preach about abortion, I don't want to be pegged as a crazy right-wing conservative. Well, I am a conservative, and I don't have a fear that you would think I am. Third reason people are afraid, preachers are afraid, most preachers are so overwhelmed with what they do that if they bring up abortion, there'll be a big fallout from the sermon and they don't want to deal with it. The fourth fear that preachers have, I'm afraid I will drive women away who've had abortions from my church. I wouldn't do that. I present hope, I present forgiveness, I present let's start over again. We've all done things we wish we never would have done. We all need to start over. The fifth reason people like preachers don't mention it. They feel inadequate <clears throat> to address the issue of abortion. And some feel it will split the church. I don't feel inadequate. I don't think it'll split our church. Subsequently, many pastors fear being thought of as out of touch or extreme if they mention abortion. They convince themselves that it's better to not address abortion at all so it won't get in the way of preaching the gospel. I believe we cannot be neutral on the subject, but we must be civil. As a result of the leaked draft opinion of the Supreme Court, indicating a possible reversal of Roe versus Wade, I've been praying for an appropriate way to address the contentious issue. I feel I must say something about it as your minister. As a Christian, I'm stuntly pro-life and therefore elated that it appears the Supreme Court is going to reverse the position, and I say thank goodness for that. However, should the court be courageous enough to follow through with overturning rule and Wade, the choice may be left for each state to decide themselves what each state is going to do. Consequently, there would still be much work left to do. Remember, therefore, we must not grow weary in doing good. 
It's been disturbing to watch the outrage and the threatening behavior of many political progressives who think abortion has become a sacred right and it's okay to use abortion as birth control, which is immoral. I do not understand the heart of a person who harasses or resorts to violence at the possibility the Supreme Court ruling might create additional barriers to killing babies. The Bible says that Satan, our adversity, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Indeed, Satan and his helpers are showing their true selves as our nation appears hopelessly divided. The one principle that keeps coming to my mind is this. We cannot be neutral. We must be civil. Some Christians avoid conflict, so they bend over backwards to appear impartial. Yet it's impossible to remain neutral about killing babies who are knit together in the mother's womb. Psalm 139, verse 13, you need to underline it in your Bible, print it and put it on your refrigerator. It reads, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. That's God. That's Psalm 139, verse 13. In the Old Testament, David, who wrote that, would be shocked at how easily the unborn are destroyed today. Millions of abortions occur every year, and politically and social acceptance may numb believers to this ongoing reality. Here David shows God's love for the unborn, and their mothers, and the fathers. We need to pray for the protection of those lives. While every life is precious to God, unborn children warrant special care because they are the most vulnerable. We do not have a voice. They cannot defend or take care of themselves, so we must. God's character goes into the creation of every person. When you feel worthless, you will begin to hate yourself. Remember that God's Spirit is ready and willing to work within you. Because of Jesus Christ, we are persons. So we should have as much respect and regard for ourselves as our Maker has for us. God is omnipresent, meaning he is present everywhere. Because of this, you can never be lost to the Holy Spirit of God. This is good news to those who know and love God. Because no matter what you do or where you go, we can never be far from God's guidance and comforting presence. Yes, even in our mother's wombs. You cannot be lukewarm on the issue. Otherwise, you're like the Civil War soldier who wore a blue coat and gray trousers and he was shot at from both sides. Elijah, in the Old Testament, drew a line in the sand for the Israelites and demanded. This comes from 1 Kings 18, verse 21. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Elijah says, how long will you waver between two opinions? Elijah challenged the people to take a stand to follow whoever was the true God. Why did so many people waver between two choices? Perhaps some were not sure. Many, however, know that the Lord was God, but were enjoying the sinful pleasures and other benefits that came with following Ahab in his adulterous worship. Taking a stand for the Lord is not just important, it will ultimately save your life. If we merely drift along with whatever is pleasant, whatever is easy, we will some way discover that we've been worshiping a false god ourselves. And the consequence of that choice will last for eternity. On the other hand, we must remain civil. Jesus told us to love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. That comes from Matthew 5, verses 44 and 45. It's not easy to support a pro-life position and refrain from getting into heated debates with those who disagree. Yet God's people are specifically instructed, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's Romans 12, verse 21. I'll read it again. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Killing babies is evil. Solomon wrote, 
Proverbs 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up the anger. Have you ever tried to argue and whisper? Arguing with someone who insists on answering softly or gently is equally difficult. On the other hand, a rising voice and harsh words almost always trigger an angry response. To turn away, raft, and seek peace, choose quiet, choose gentle words. Notice it's not silence that turns away raft, but a truthful answer given in a soft, comfortable tone is the most effective response to raise. The pro-life movement has truth. It has logic. It has compassion on its side. This is not a time for us to retreat into cowardly silence. Not a time to outshout the opposition. It's a time to follow the clear instructions given in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. It is Christ from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. Let's passionately communicate the good news that for liars, thieves, blasphemers, pornographers, idol worshipers, adulterers, abortionists, and for women who have had abortions, there is complete and total forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There is hope there. There is forgiveness. The same grace on which we depend knows no limitations. A woman who has undergone abortion and has turned to faith in Jesus needs never be concerned that God is against her or God is locking her in her past mistakes. She's the daughter of the Most High King. She is beloved. The same with the abortion doctor who turns away from that horrible practice to follow Jesus Christ. Christ made the church so that we can help each other grow and mature into our faith. When we join with Christ, he forms us into a group united in purpose to love one another for the Lord. If one stumbles, the rest of the group picks up that person and helps him or her walk with God again. The person since he or she can find restoration through the church as the rest of the group continues to proclaim God's truth. So don't try to live the Christian life on your own. Reach out to somebody. Don't do it on your own. Find a church that accepts you as you are, that's committed to loving and help you grow in your love for God and others and mature in your faith so that you become a witness for Christ. As part of Christ's body, you can reflect his character, carry out your special role in the work he's called the church to do. May we communicate such good news this Sunday and every Sunday. There is hope, there is forgiveness. Praise the Lord. Seek the Lord while he can be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you today for the gift of life and for the lives of all my brothers and sisters. I know there is nothing that destroys more life than abortion. We're ready to do our part in ending abortion. Today we commit ourselves never to be silent, never to be passive, never to be forgetful of the unborn. We commit ourselves to never stop defending life until all my brothers and sisters are protected and our nation once again becomes a nation with liberty and justice, not just for some, but for all through Christ our Lord. Lord, I pray with these that are here gathered today. This was on purpose. There was a reason we came together. There is a reason we're thinking about abortion. Guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.